did you know that before you can become an astronaut, you first have to become an aquanaut? I didn't know that you, it's a very little known fact, but you actually have to train in water for the feeling of weightlessness before you go and explore outer space. So thank you all for braving the uh, Saturday morning hangover. Uh, <laughs> It's a pleasure to be amongst you today. The information that we got yesterday was certainly rich and brought a lot of invaluable perspectives. A technology not only has a place, but plays a pivotal role in securing a healthy future of our planet. You know, my first internship out of college was a small company called Seventh Generation. And their mantra, as far as a business, was to follow a North American Indian saying that for every deliberation, we must consider the impact on the next seven generations. Innovation has brought us into space. And looking back from that lonely emptiness at our little blue planet, we quickly realize that it contains virtually everything we know, everything we cherish, and everything that we depend on. Back on Earth, water represents over 99% of our world's total living space. My grandfather, Jacques-Yves Cousteau, was fascinated by this aquatic world. He created he created innovative technologies, such as the regulator, the first underwater scientific submersibles, the first underwater habitats, the first underwater film camera housings, so that he could bring back the fascinating stories of discovery to hundreds of millions of people around the world and the message that came with it. Yet, even his ex exploits and many others like him of modern ocean explorations to date only encompass about 75%, or I'm sorry, about 5% <laughs> of our world's oceans. So we have quite a bit left to discover in the ocean world. By most estimates, this 99% of our living space contains almost 95% of the world's total biodiversity. We have a lot left to discover. Why do I mention this? Aside from the obvious that I'm myself addicted to ocean exploration, water is quite literally the circulatory system of life that connects us all. When you're skiing on top of a mountain a thousand miles away from the oceans, you are skiing on the oceans. What we're doing to our planet, our oceans, we're doing to ourselves. After having listened to many amazing speakers yesterday, I am left with some fundamental questions. How can we imagine taking care of an increasing elderly population if we do not take care of our own planet's health? How can we fathom feeding a growing number of human beings when our natural bank account is going bankrupt? How can we promise sustainable development and the hope for equal access to basic human rights, food, water, shelter, health, when our own baseline models are fundamentally flawed? Our global economic crisis has the underpinnings rooted deep in the failing environmental health of our planet. Should we continue to fail to address, we cannot be surprised at the results that are manifesting themselves today. The health of our planet is the health of people. The health of our planet is the health of our economy. You cannot have either of those with a failing ecosystem. Now, fish don't have passports, and water does not stop flowing 
at political boundaries drawn on some map. These concepts connect us all. National policies for environmental stewardship are paramount, but strong multinational partnerships to tackle issues of climate change, overconsumption of natural resources, and pollution are essential if we are to set off for a brighter future. We live on a small, closed-loop system. Our actions must reflect this. Something too often overlooked is that a strong moral and ethical approach by government and by private enterprise may, very, may have very real, tangible, long-term environmental health and economic benefits. By no longer living on this planet, but rather living with this planet, we are investing in our future. We must look to our planet as a natural resource bank account to invest in the capital and to live off the interest because there are no bailouts. Only by, by fully fulfilling the educational and technological approaches through the trans-border public, private, and government partnerships can we imagine restoring the life support system that we so depend on. My grandfather used to say, if we were only logical creatures, the future would look bleak indeed. But we are much more than logical, and we have hope. I'd like to share a small story of hope with you. When I started my nonprofit, Plant to Fish, I, we had the unbelievable uh, and, and privileged opportunity to be able to uh, go into El Salvador, a country that has its own challenges for uh, economics and environmental issues. But we were able to engage a community who's been vilified by, decimate, by saying that they were decimating sea turtle populations. There are five sea uh, endangered sea turtle populations that depend on the El Salvadoran beaches to reproduce. And the tortugueros, the fishermen who would go and collect those eggs to sell to the black market, had no choice in order to be able to provide for their families and their community. By giving them a choice, by engaging them, instead of being the culprits, becoming the conservationists, and using their services and paying for their services, and helping us restore these five species of sea turtles, we were able to take not only a community of 160 tortugueros, over 800 people within three communities, and get them to go from a zero recruitment rate of sea turtle populations to over 230,000 hatchlings released just last year. The long-term goal is to train them in various different disciplines so that they can, don't have to rely on NGOs such as ourselves and we can become obsolete. And it's thanks to synergies between entities such as USAID, local government, and private organizations that we're able to offer these solutions. Thanks to efforts like this, we have hope. And those kinds of efforts are becoming more and more prevalent. But we are at a pivotal moment where we must push forward as hard and as fast as we can in order to create a much better planet for our future progeny. Looking into a child's eyes, it is not possible to sit idly by, knowing that we did not fight with every ounce of our human being to provide the right for our future generations to be able to enjoy that which we've thus far taken for granted. I'd like to share one last thing with you. I found recently a document from my grandfather, dated March of 1995, in which he stood in front of a crowd at the World Summit, and it mentions Rio. I stand before you at this great gathering 
what is called a summit of hope, commitment, and action. I pray it will be so. I remember such feelings of hope before in the passions of the corridors at Rio, in the unprecedented gatherings of the heads of state, in the tangible excitement that something momentous has, was being achieved. I heard hope in the voices of the people. I even felt it physically in the black and blue marks on my own arms from the crowds as they pressed together in surging parade, shouting their expectations of change. I myself wrote that great hope, fragile but immense, has been born at Rio. There too, commitments were made. I did everything I could to help propagate my hope. I even signed all my letters in the spirit of Rio. 20 years later, we're given a second chance. Let's show the world that Rio Plus 20 can make the dreams of generations past become the reality of generations to come. Thank you very much.